do my best. Uh, just in, in, in terms of disclosure, let me tell you that I was trained at the University of Chicago, not only in chemistry, but in law and economics. Uh, and I've been fighting 38 years trying to disown the baptism. But like Achilles, if you don't put the entire body in the river, the baptism doesn't take. And so uh, I don't know what I, can, what I can add. It's interesting that in the United States, we have a council of economic advisors. We don't have a council of uh, social advisors or uh, any other kind of advisors. But, uh, and I've been talking for a long time uh, about not contracting the American disease, which of course, unfortunately, was endemic. How do I move the... Uh, beyond my knowledge. How do I move the slides? This mouse? The red one? The right one? Ah, okay. Uh, I've spent the last 12 years concerning myself with sustainable development. I've read almost everything that's been written in that area. People say it's a vague concept. It's not a vague concept. It's just multidimensional. <clears throat> and it, I've just submitted a book with the title of, uh, of the talk, Technology, Globalization, and Sustainable Development, Transforming the Industrial State, which is, uh, in a sense, could have been a subtitle of the previous uh, presentation. Uh, let me say a few things, and I'll try to get through a lot of material in a short time. First of all, I've put on one slide what I view to be the problems of the industrial state. It's all on this slide. It's all here. And so what do we have? Well, uh, we've got some problems, right? And they're in three different colors. One is that we don't have enough of the needed goods and services to serve the people who live in the industrial or industrializing state. A lot of people have a lot of things. Some people do not have enough housing drugs and whatever. So the, the market or whatever or the system has not delivered for very many people. And the number of people living below the poverty line, even in the northern countries, is increasing. So we should not break our arm patting ourselves on the bat at having done such a terribly good job. The, 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 the green entries in the problem areas are appropriately the environment. Now, if you were to count the number of of centimeters in the press or the number of minutes devoted to environmental problems, overwhelmingly today, it's global climate change. But in fact, that's not the only problem and it's not the only tipping point that we face. Toxic pollution continues to be a major problem, um, the destruction of ecosystems, uh, and all of these problems have their origin in what Herman Daly calls the throughput society. You churn materials and energy out into stuff and you sell it. And uh, we've reached a limit, limits to growth, as to how much the earth can, um, can absorb. And so toxic pollution, climate disruption, biodiversity, and resource depletion, until recently, if you looked up environment and you Googled environment, three quarters of the literature in the economics profession would be about resources. This is what environmental economics was at one time. Now, there's also an environmental injustice or justice problem which will be the subject of a panel tomorrow about the differential burden and I won't address that issue now. The third problem is that we're facing an enormous jobs problem. And although I'm an environmentalist, I want to here to tell you and I hope you remember the problem facing political systems in the next two decades is going to be jobs. It's not going to be environment and it's not going to be energy. I don't mean it would solve those problems. I mean the thing that are going to push public policy is going to be that there's not enough purchasing power in the society, neither in developed nor in developing countries, and the number of people needed as it were, to work the industrial state, whether you call them knowledge workers or whatever you call them, they're not enough to support a purchasing power, which also explains why nations are export-oriented 
because there isn't enough demand. When we say in the northern countries we have overcapacity, the other side of the coin is we don't have the demand. The reason you don't have the demand is you don't have enough earning capacity, and this is now a crucial issue towards which environmentalists do not pay any attention, okay? Now, there is a differential in earning power and wealth, and that gives rise not only to an injustice of the environmental kind, but an economic inequity. And these inequities are being felt, and this is what drives the system. Now, what can I add to the prior speech? Well, you know, the, the Economist 101 tells you you've got a supply side of the market, you've got a demand side of the market. The trick of economics is to make sure supply and demand is in equilibrium, even though when I'll reference the recent Nobel Prize in uh, labor economics, of whom uh, uh, Christopher uh, Passaridis, a Greek Cypriot, one, is one of the Nobel laureates, showed that, you know, that equivalently, uh, structural unemployment, which we used to think was 3% because you couldn't match the skill of the workers with the, skill, with the, with the skills demanded, it was 3%. It's probably closer to 10% today because the, there is such a disjuncture between what industry says it needs and what, how we're educating our, our people. And so uh, the labor equation becomes extremely important. And of course, we know that equilibrium is not the only purpose of industrial systems. And when you invoke the issue of innovation, it's innovation that moves you from parsing out the existing assets and asking for win-win situations in which you can have simultaneous gains in economic welfare, employment, and environmental equality if you do it right. Now, I tell my students there are many more ways to do it wrong than to do it right. And by God, we are ingenious in finding the ways to do it wrong. And I will not, you know, expand on that at this point. The solutions, right? Because you have to have solutions. You can't just simply yell about the problems. They come in five varieties. One of them is, of course, education and human resource development. General education so that people are smart and are critical thinkers and actually vote their interests at the, at, the, at the voting booth. I mean, we are in a situation in the United States where people are voting for candidates that are not really promoting their interests. There is a total loss of critical thinking capacity in the American population. And it is the same thing is happening in Greece and in the UK. And if you don't have a capacity to think critically about a problem, you are going to make wrong decisions. And maybe Plato was right, you know, democracy, uh, evolves into the, the rule of the mob unless you have an educated polity, and we haven't been able to do that. You need human resources so that we know how to get the solutions that we're trying to get and find the clever ways and the ways of not doing it wrong. Industry says, well, we did it wrong. It's our problem. Leave it to us. We'll take care of it. And when British Petroleum and Shell argue that they're going to become energy companies, don't believe a word of it. The head, uh, the, the head of, of Shell Research, Vice President, came to MIT a year ago under the rubric of giving a talk which said, you know, uh, innovation and the energy challenge. So we all rushed, 500 people rushed to hear what this energy company was going to tell us. And what did he talk about? Extracting oil from shale. Boston, BP, even before the recent debacle, was even more absurd. The head of the advisory committee came to MIT under the title of the talk, you know, the petroleum industry's contribution to global warming. I swear to God, what he suggested was putting up thousands of mirrors into space to reflect the sun. This, the only thing that more amazing, right, more amazing were these two talks was that nobody in the audience objected. Nobody said anything. They just sat there and listened. No challenge. Nobody stood up and said, you're talking nonsense. Have you got something else to say? I mean, this is the status in many ways of the academic endeavor in educating our students of the future. Government intervention and regulation. Well, you could never talk about government regulation. You notice nobody talks about de government deregulation anymore in public. Not Summers, not anybody, right? But, of course, I'm not saying they're not thinking about it, but there is a call for government regulation were we only to have antitrust regulation, banking regulation, environmental regulation. In fact, government has never been so anemic in terms of being able to get something really that changes the, the landscape. Stakeholder involvement. The stakeholders do not involve, do not trust either 
government or industry. That's why they want to become involved. And, you know, I've read, as I say, a lot that's been written about sustainable development. And you find Gus Spess's new book that talks about a progressive force coming up from the workers and the environmentalists and the socially affected to change society. Well, if you believe that's going to happen, I have a bridge I'd like to sell you. You know, nowhere in his work he talks about the rule of law and the role of government. And uh, the father, one of the fathers of ecological economics, Bob Costanza, in his new book, he came to MIT and he talked about his new book. You know, and generally speaking, you, you have to have three things the academic tells you about reaching sustainability. First, you have to understand what makes the world unsustainable. Then you have to have an idea of a vision for sustainability. What would it look like? And then the third question that's usually asked is, well, uh, what are the carrots and sticks that you need to put together so the thing happens? There's a fourth question that's missing. Between having a vision and having an incentive system which will make a machine run a different way, you have to ask the following question. Who's standing in our way? Now, that's a political question. Who's standing in our way of doing the right thing? And those forces are so incredibly powerful and so incredibly concentrated that I'll tell you, from my perspective, I don't think the U.S. has a chance of leading the world in sustainability advancement. I give Europe a much better chance, and people say I romanticize Europe, but I see movements here and a lack of problems that exist in the U.S. that would render that possible. But anyway, that's just my perception. There are some less than 10 major systemic problems, and if we don't address those problems, no quick technological fix, no cancer cure, none of the rest of it's going to be able to solve our problems. What are the problems? Well, we have a fragmented knowledge base, departments of economics, departments of chemical engineering, law schools. They still are totally fragmented. And I used to think that single disciplines like economics or law or chemical engineering, focusing only on one part of the problem was the enemy of what I call transdisciplinary thinking. I now believe that the enemy of transdisciplinary thinking is multidisciplinary thinking. You give the engineer some capacity to do economic calculations and he figures he's got it covered. Well, it's a lot more complicated than that, okay? So, you know, partway solutions are not going to solve the problem. The political scientists will tell us there's an inequality of access to economic and political power, of course. A word that I coined, there's a tendency of industrial system towards gerundocracy. You know what it means. Governance by the old or governance by the old ideas, which presents technological and political lock-in, usually but not always accompanied by concentrations of economic and political power. Of course, the economist with his hand in the back of the room is going to say, no, 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 it's that the prices aren't right. The prices aren't right. If you get the prices right, you're not going to solve global warming because of the discounting problem. So, uh, 